All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you guys. It's supposed to be a very warm morning, I think, or a warm day today. So thank the Lord for that. Hey, we're going to pick up where we left off last week in the uh, book of First John. So everybody, please grab a Bible and turn it to First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. I believe Peter left off last week in verse 12, and we're going to pick up in verse 13. Um, so, just just you know, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of a longer intro than I normally do, and you're going to see why in just a second. Um, but I'd like for everybody to, if you would, um, especially if you have the text on your phone, just make sure you can see all the way through the text. I want to show you guys something. And uh, you'll, you'll find out why here in just a moment. So everybody, you're in verse 13, chapter 5, verse 13, okay? So let's take a look at a couple things. Look at verse 13. It says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. You see that word know, K-N-O-W? Um, underline that, highlight it. If you're taking notes, put it on the side. Verse 13, there's the word know. Then go down to verse 14. It says, This is the confidence which we have before Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. So if you're taking notes, or if you're into highlighting your Bible, underline that word, confidence. Then go to verse 15. It says this, And if we know, there's that word, underline it, that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know, underline it, that we have the requests which have been asked from Him. Now go down to verse uh, 18. We know, underline it, that no one who is born of God sins. Now that's a mouthful there. We'll get to that in a later sermon. Verse 19. We know, underline, that we are of God. Look at verse 20. And we know, underline, that we are, um, that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know, underline, him who is true. Now, every time, just, just by the way, let's, let's count here. So we have one, uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven times the word no is used in these nine verses that are in front of us. He also uh, uses this word confidence. By the way, every time this word no is used, it's the same Greek word. And it's, it's uh, uh, oikios, which what it means is, it's to have um, the, an intimate familiarity with this concept. So whatever it is that we're supposed to know, we're supposed to know it as if uh, we, or how we know our own family. Uh, the word is, it's a knowledge that you have when you belong to a household. In other words, you guys know your families, and we know your family you know, more than anybody. I mean, you, you get away with stuff in your family that you, get, you can't get away with on the outside because you see the good, the bad, the ugly, right? And so you're just so familiar and so intimate with your family. That's the idea here, is that this, this, whatever it is that God is trying to teach us in these verses, it's supposed to be so familiar to us that it's just secondhand knowledge. It's, it's this knowledge that's made its way and its home in our hearts. So when we just take this aerial view of the text like we just did, and by the way, we're not going to get to all nine verses today. In fact, I think we're just going to get to one verse today, and we'll take care of the rest in the subsequent weeks. But what God is trying to do here, I think, is He's showing us, it's very obvious, that He wants us to be confident in these certain things. He wants us to know and not question. He wants us to know in a very deep and intimate way these certainties that he's bringing before us in the text. Christian confidence. You know, when, when believers are confident, when Christians are confident, that really makes the world very upset. It makes the world really mad when Christians walk around confidently about whatever it is, whatever God's Word says. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And there's a spiritual warfare that's going on. We have the, the prince of the power of the air. You know, uh, Satan's sort of in charge of this world system, and everybody who's part of this is, is doing his bidding and so forth. And, and those, the world system goes directly against those things that are important to God. So you have this spiritual warfare that's happening. But there's also something else at work here. I think it's very obvious that we live on a planet that is perpetually uncertain and doubtful and wavering. 
I mean, think about it. Uh, people in this world fear for their livelihoods. They fear for their health. They fear for their relationships. They fear for their future. They fear for uh, fear of death. And, and we live in this ever-growing uncertain times. Here we are, we have this COVID thing, and we're scared because we're hearing about these other strains that might come and get us. Um, but, uh, put COVID aside, we're wondering when the next police shooting is going to be, and when's the, what's going to happen next so that the, the streets are going to be set ablaze again, and chaos is going to ensue. When's that going to happen? How about right and wrong? We're so uncertain about what's right, what's wrong. We're changing that constantly in this society. I think in the last 10 or 20 years, since the century began, it's been happening exponentially. Uh, all of this uncertainty. You know, we, we can't even be certain these days about what gender is. And guys, you know, on a home level, on a practical level, we're uncertain about how people treat us. You know, the people that are supposed to treat us the best, with the most love, our parents, our children, our, our wife, our husband, and we're not even certain about whether or not they want to treat us well or not. So you have all this uncertainty, and I think it's being perpetuated, promoted on news, social media, politics. All of this uncertainty, all of this wavering back and forth about what morality is all about, and then along come the Christians. With all of their certainty and all of their confidence, at least that's the way it's supposed to be. You know, see, so against the backdrop of, of this doubt and uncertainty that we live in and we're surrounded by, there's the Word of God. There's the Bible. The, literally, God's revelation that is filled with absolute certainties. See, the Bible is not uncertain about anything. The Bible is absolutely confident about everything. And why is that? Because the Bible is God's Word, and God is absolutely confident about everything. Sometimes we're, we're so confident, we're accused of being arrogant. But, but we don't base our confidence on ourselves. We know because God tells us so. Uh, let me give you some examples. See, Christians, we're, we're confident about how the universe began. Now, I know that the world would counter that. They say, well, we have a theory about how the universe began. It's a wrong theory, but they're very confident of it. At least they say they are. Okay, that's fine. I'll grant you that. But here's the other thing. We know how the universe is going to end. And that's something the world hadn't caught up to. The world says the universe won't end, or they're hoping against all hope that it won't. But we know from God's Word, oh yeah, this universe, God's going to pack it up and then do something new. We know that. Um, we're confident about what is right and what is wrong. The world is absolutely not confident about what is right and what is wrong. Again, that's changing all the time. We're confident of the things, the elements that make up good relationships. God's Word, He tells us how to be married. God's Word tells us how to be parents, how to be children. God's Word tells us how to be employees and employers. God's Word tells us how to treat one another in love, our brothers and sisters in Christ. God's Word tells us you are to love your neighbor as yourself, and very confidently tells us these things. The, the people in the world, of the world, they have no idea how to treat each other. How about this? Christians walk around confidently about what is necessary to get to heaven. We are confident that there is a heaven, that there is a hell, and we know how people get to either of those places. You talk to people in the world, no, what they've come to is, well, there is no God, there is no heaven, there is no hell, let's just take care of that and push that aside, because it scares them to death. Beloved, we're, we're confident in God's promises. We're confident in God's Son. We're confident in His death for us, His substitutionary death for us. We are confident in His literal resurrection, and we are confident that our Lord is coming back for us. We are confident in that. None of these things is accepted in our society. And that's what makes us unique. Uniquely confident in a doubtful, wavering world. Even religion teaches 
So many of the religions of the world, in fact, I think all of them, all of the non-biblical Christianity religions, even some Christian denominations and philosophies out there, there, there's something about religion that tells you, they want to keep you on the hook. No one can ever, ever know where they're going to go when they die. That's something that's perpetuated even in the spiritual world. And that's why it's so important that we look at verse 13 closely today. So, here we have this passage, and we have many passages in the Scriptures, but God has given us this gift in these nine verses that we're going to look at the next couple of Sundays, where He gives us a list of things of what Christians are allowed to be, better yet, that Christians must be confident about. Beloved, we've got to stop living as if we're uncertain about the Lord and about salvation and about His life that He's given us and His Spirit and all of the power that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. We've got to stop it. And so, the, the title of this message and the messages to come is going to be Christian Confidence. And today is part one. And before we pray here, I'm just going to give you the first one on the list. And this is the one we're going to look at in depth today. Mark this down if you're taking notes. Number one thing on the list here. God's children are to be absolutely confident that we have eternal life. And that confidence needs to strengthen our inner man. God's children are to be absolutely confident that we have eternal life, that we have God's life in us, if you genuinely know Christ. Before we go any further on it, let's ask God to be our teacher. Would you please bow with me, and I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for salvation. We thank you for your discipleship of us. Lord, we thank you uh, for your investment in us. We thank you, God, that you... Um, paid the absolute highest, deepest price for our soul. Lord, you, you bought us with your blood, your sacrifice. You gave your life for your children so that we would have eternal life. Lord, we're thankful that you make things right and, and you clear up the, the cobwebs and all the lies that we are surrounded by every single day that we live, all the things we hear, the inner whispers of the evil one, that, uh, that, that come to us silently in the evening. God, all of the things that are loudly being blasted at from this world, Lord, your word tells us what's true. We're thankful. But I, I think the church, um, uh, we've been weakened because we're not confident, and I don't mean arrogant. I mean confident in you and what you've given us, this great, incredible gift called eternal life. That's supposed to be something that makes us different and gives us power to do your work and your will. So I pray, Holy Spirit, today, this is your pulpit, so take it. And take this verse and take these notes. Lord, make this thing come alive inside of us. Convict us. Encourage us. Admonish us. Teach us. And do all the things that only you can do. Lord, I pray that we would come to the text today, pushing aside any uh, preconceived presumption and assumption. And Lord, we'd be humble. We humbly bow and sit at your feet, Lord Jesus, and listen to you teach us. Because, Lord, we want to be different. We want to live practically, live out the kingdom, live with the gospel, fight the good fight of faith. So, Lord, would you invest in us this morning as only you can. And it's in Jesus' name we ask this. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go back to verse 13. Here's our verse for today. <laughs> These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Why? Well, so that you may know that you have eternal life. These things I've written. What things, John? Well, this whole letter. All five chapters. So everything that is written here has been written for the purpose of you knowing that you have eternal life. Um, those of you who know Jesus need to also know that you have his life within you. Can, can you imagine if Jesus did something like this? So, uh, and there's so many places I could turn in the Gospels, uh, you know, where Jesus himself said, if you know me, you have eternal life. Um, 
Let me just look at a couple places here. Like in John 6, 27, he talks about, he says, eternal life, which the Son of Man, that's Jesus, will give to you. For on him the Father, even God, has set his seal. So not only has Jesus given you his life, but he sealed it. Um, how about this one? When Jesus said, John 6, uh, 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. So imagine if Jesus said, okay, you believe in me? Here, here's a gift of eternal life. There you go. I'm giving you this gift. Now, I want you to walk around and live your life as if I didn't give you the gift. What kind of cruel irony, cruel trick would that be? And I think maybe all of you would say, you sold me, Willie. You had me at hello, right? You, 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 I, I'm with it. Yeah, eternal life, I got it. Well, wait a minute. Time out. It's one thing to theologically, doctrinally believe that, but how many of us practically believe that? I mean, how many of us fully embrace this to the point that we're not saying, we're not walking around living life as if we've got eternal life, but we could lose it. That we could be so bad that, you know, it's given away, it's, it's lost. Or how many of us think we have eternal life, we know that here, but in our lives practically we're thinking, well, I have eternal life, but it's, you know, it's like half full, because Bud, he has like a full glass of eternal life, and I just got a, you know, a fourth of a glass, because Bud's better than me. So John says, look, I wrote this whole letter. You remember the, the, basically why John wrote the letter, the purpose of it, is to distinguish between counter-Christianity from true Christianity. That's the whole reason why he wrote it. So over and over again he says, okay, you say you're in Christ? Well, here's a test. You say you're in Jesus, you, you love Jesus, but then do you hate your brother? Well, then you fail the test. You say you love God, but you love the world. Well, that can't be. You fail the test. So over and over again, he's saying, let me distinguish between what real Christianity looks like from the fake kind. And he says, and the reason I'm doing that is not to exasperate you. It's not to, to mix you up and, and, and make you, you know, fuzzy on the inside. He says, I'm telling you this so that you will know that you know that you know. You'll know if you've been pretending, you'll know you're pretending, and, and you'll come to Christ genuinely. And you also know that if you pass the test, you don't have to doubt it. It's interesting, um, John, so John wrote the Gospel of John, and we have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the epistles, okay? He wrote all of these books at about the same time. Uh, he was exiled out in the Patmos, and uh, we think he wrote the gospel somewhere between 85 and 90 A.D. He wrote the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John letters in about 90 A.D. So, in the Gospel of John, this is how John ends it. So John wrote this gospel. It's 21 chapters. It's 20 chapters of watching Jesus live and in technicolor. And then he has one chapter that he kind of tacks on the end as an addendum to kind of clear up some stuff that came up, okay? So at the end of John chapter 20, the last verse, John chapter 20, verse 31, listen to what John says. He says, I have written these things to you, what things? The whole gospel. Why? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. So John wrote his gospel so that we get a front row seat to Jesus Christ, the life and times of Jesus, the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ, all so that we would believe in him, in Christ. And that by believing, we would have, know that we have his life. Now you fast forward over here to 1 John at the end of it. Here in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, he says, Okay, I've written this letter to you so that those of you who know Jesus, the Gospel of John has done its job, and you believed, and you believed in his, the, Son of God's, the, na the name of the Son of God. Now that you know Jesus, you need to know that you have eternal life. That eternal life that was brought to you and given to you, you've got to know that you have it. In other words, John wants to eliminate any lingering doubt about our salvation. You know, there, 
There's so many ways and whispers and systems and all of these things, these philosophies that are out there telling you, you can't know. You, you can't know. You know, and the thing is, is what we believe in our minds and our hearts, we practice. It comes out practically in our life. What you believe, you will do, you will live. So again, imagine, you know, believing in Jesus, you, you, you claim to receive this gift of eternal life because you surrendered your life and heart. You've come to the place where you see your wretchedness, your sin. And you say, Lord, I'm a wretch. So I turn to God, I turn to Christ, and I go to his cross and I say, Lord Jesus, you died for me. And I'm asking you and you alone, Lord Jesus, for forgiveness for my sin. And I'm going to give you my life. Lord, you're my everything. I completely believe in you and you alone for the salvation of my sin, from my sin, and to Lord my life. Can you imagine coming to that place and then living as if you can have that eternal life taken away? Talk about frustration. Talk about disappointment. Talk about being stressed out. I can't imagine anything worse than going all the way through your life with some kind of loyalty to Jesus, only at the end of your life to have lived the entirety of it in doubt of whether or not you belong to Christ and whether or not you're going to see Him when you die. To live the Christian life without the hope of heaven, no thank you. And that is not biblical. So Willie, are you saying that we can know, that we can be assured we have it? Absolutely. And how do you know that? Well, because God said so. It's not because of my opinion. It's because God said it. Um, so here's what you do. And sometimes we doubt. Sometimes those questions come up. Paul even alludes to that at the end of uh, one of the Corinthians, right? He, we he says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Test yourself to see if you pass or fail. Okay, that's fair. Here's what you do. Take your life and put it next to this letter. You've been given this gift of 1 John. Take your life and stick it right next to the things in 1 John and see if you pass this, these tests. So let me ask you. Okay. Um, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God who paid the price for you, who died and bled for you on your behalf, that He is the Son of God and He rose from the dead? Do you believe that? Okay. So you understand, apart from Him, you, I, we're sinful wretches. We're not just neutral beings, good, mostly. No, we're wretches. And that's what drove us to Christ. Do you realize that? Do you, you accept and embrace that? Okay. How about this? Um, do you manifest day in and day out the evidence of a transformed life in ways like this? Do you love God? Do you love Jesus? Good. How about this? Do you love others? Now, we're not talking perfection here, gang, okay? I know, there, you know, sometimes, like when your wife forgets the key to, the, to open up the church building, you know? <laughs> sometimes you don't love her as much as you should. I'm not talking about perfection here. But do you love others? That's the, that's the overall direction of your heart. In fact, even those who harm you, after you get over the pain of that, you say, God, I want your best for them. I don't want them to go to hell. I want them to be saved. Is that your heart? Okay. How about this? Do you have a hatred toward this world system? You know, the the reputation of God just being slung around in the mud. What, what's good, what's bad, is just constantly, it looks like we're, we're, more and more, we're taking what's bad and making that good, what's good and making that bad, right? Take the opposite of what God says is holy, pure, and right, and that's what the world is saying, the opposite of that is what is good and right in this world. So, do you buy that? Are you into it? Do you, like, are you partnering with the world? Or, does it make you sick to your stomach? Good. How about this? 
is the overall direction of your life a life of obedience? And again, I'm not talking perfection. I'm not saying do you live a perfect life, because nobody would be able to say yes except Christ. But even when you stumble, and you will, and God picks you up, you say, I learn from that, and I keep moving forward. I keep persevering. I want to do, oh, do I want to do the will of God. More than anything, I want to do His will. Even though you mess up. Like Romans 7, right, Paul says, oh, this struggle with my flesh, man, it's so horrible. And yet, you keep going. Is that you? Okay. So I just basically summarize the entirety of First John, uh, the letter of 1 John. And if you pass those tests, then you're allowed to say, I know I have eternal life. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. That's the song in Christ alone. And guys, I just, I want to tell you, all of this, the key to all of this is not ourselves. We're not to be assured of anything based on us. All of our confidence and all of our assurance and all of our certainty is because we're so confident and certain in Him. That's why you can't call it arrogance, because we're confident in what Jesus said He would do, what He did, what, who He is, what He did, and what He promised to give us as a result. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Him. We're not to be confident in ourselves. My goodness. That would only get me maybe five inches forward in my life. Maybe. No. No, no. We're not to be confident in ourselves. We're supposed to be confident in humble, in humble faith in Christ. And because we acknowledge that God, His only Son, His death, His resurrection, that's the only way to hope. And that's why we can know we have His life in us. I want to show you something. Make a note of this. Please don't forget it. Back in John's Gospel in chapter 10. Wonderful passage here. John 10, verses 27 and 28. Jesus is talking to the religious uh, leadership of the day who hate him. They hate him. And uh, he says a lot of things to them. But among them, he says this. John 10, verse 27, he says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. You know, sheep... Uh, are just, uh, well, they're dumb. They're just as stupid a creature as God's ever created, okay? And, and they're in a fold, so they, they stick together, but then, of course, you've got one that wanders over here, eats the wrong plant, gets sick. You've got another one that wanders over here, too close to a predator. Well, sometimes they wander way out there, so the shepherd has to leave them in the fold, go get that sheep, and bring them back, and he always will. Sometimes they, they get stuck in, you know, tire swings and, and all kind of stuff. But Jesus says, and, and we can kind of tie that into us. I know we like to be called stallions and bears and lions, and no, we're sheep. Um, but God says, yeah, they're mine. They hear my voice. As stupid as sheep can be, they will always recognize and hear and follow their shepherd's voice. And, and God says, Jesus says, my sheep hear me and they follow me. And then he says this, I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. This is a promise. And... On top of that, no one will snatch them out of my hand. This is why we have confidence in our, our salvation, in our eternal life. Not because of us, but because of the great shepherd who's promised he's given us his life if we believe in him. I know there shouldn't be any such thing as insecure Christianity, guys. He doesn't want us walking in life wondering if we've been forgiven or not. He doesn't want us walking in the light and then thinking at the same time we're still, you know, in Satan's darkness. 
So again, look at your life. If you're obeying the commands of Christ, if you're loving God, loving others, not loving the world, if you're confessing Jesus as God, practicing righteousness, if you're experiencing that internal confident witness of the Holy Spirit, you can be sure. Um, just real quickly, peek down for me at back in 1 John 5. Look at verse 20, the end of verse 20. I love this little section of this verse. I love it. 1 John 5, 20, at the end, John is talking about Jesus. And he says, Jesus Christ, he says, this is the true God and eternal life. He's saying Jesus is the true God and Jesus is eternal life. Wow. So what does that mean? Well, it means this. Eternal life is not simply a quantity of life. Eternal life is not simply living forever. Guys, every soul that God created is going to live forever. It's just a matter of, will we live forever in heaven or in hell? But we're all going to live forever. That's not what eternal life ultimately is. Eternal life is not just a quantity of life. Eternal life ultimately is a quality of life of life. Eternal life is having slash owning the very life of God. Think about that. Eternal life is having the very life of God that has made us a new creation in Him. God and Christ are the eternal life and they are the power of eternal life. And to say we have eternal life is to simply say we've got the life of God in us. And that's an amazing gift. And I can't help but think of something Jesus said back in John again, John's Gospel, chapter, four, uh, chapter 14, verse 27. He's talking about his peace. He's telling his disciples, I'm going to give you my peace. Peace I leave with you, my peace I'm going to give you. And he says, oh, and by the way, I don't give gifts the way the world gives them. See, I don't give gifts and then take them back. And that's why we can be certain. Now, let me close with this. I think, I think one of the main reasons why the church is not doing its job in battling sin, in battling for the kingdom, in battling with the gospel as we're designed and called to do, I think one of the main reasons, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think one of the main reasons we're compromising and cowering toward the world, we're co compromising with the world, the church is, overall, I'm not saying you, I'm saying the church, big C, and we're cowering to the world, you know, the, the world just shouts at us, right? Do this, you, stop saying that. And the reason why we're cowering, uh, okay, um, I think one of the main reasons is because there's way too many Christians who are living unconfident lives. We don't understand the power that God's given us in eternal life. Genuine Christians have been given the greatest gift, and that's the life of God. And with it, we've been given, literally, the greatest power in the universe. That's what Paul called it in Ephesians 3.20. He called it exceeding, abundant, beyond all you could ever ask or think kind of power. And yet, how many of us live as if we have very little power? How many of us, practically, we live, you know, we know the theology, but we're living as if God, we have to still earn God's forgiveness. Every day I've got to earn God's forgiveness. How many of us are living lives where, as if there was no such thing as grace? And there was no such thing as God's mercy? Or how about, how about living life, you know, weighed down by the, the guilt of our past? How many of us are, are living life as if we have no certainty about the future? I'm not talking about circumstances. Circumstances change and they surprise us. I'm talking about ultimate future. You remember when Paul said, hey, stop looking at this. Stop setting all of your emotional and you know, spiritual and physical good on the world because the world's going to change and flop around. No, you set your heart on things above. That's your home where Jesus is. But how many of us are living as if this is it? Uh, how many of us are living life as if God hasn't shown us right from wrong? Church, 
Why are we doing what we're doing? I'm talking about the big C church. Why are we compromising? Why are we giving in? Why are we going, well, I guess the world's right about this or that. Why are we living life as if we've been given this gift that we can lose at any time? It's as if, it's like if a person was given a trillion dollars. So you got instantly somebody put Bill Gates' wealth in your bank account. Okay, Jacob, trillion bucks. You got it in your bank account. Yeah, great. But then Jacob decides, you know, I think I'm going to be homeless and live in the streets. I'm just not going to use that trillion bucks. That's how it is. Guys, we've been given all the power that we could be given. And we're living as if we have none. You say, well, what's involved in that power? Well, that would take the rest of the week for me to describe. Okay, but let me just give you a few things to think about. Did you know that God's eternal life gives you the power to say no to sin? It, it gives you the power to say no to ungodliness. Oh, and not only say no to ungodliness, but to live righteously, even in this present age. That's Titus 2.12. Did you know that God's eternal life gives you the power to know the things freely given to you by God and to understand the things of God from His Word? Think about that. How many people are asking, ah, what's, who's God? What's God? What's my purpose in life? You know, all those questions are answered if you have eternal life. You don't have to ever, ever, ever question your purpose in this life ever again. God's power, it, it comes in eternal life this way. You can bear the fruit of the life of God. We call that the fruits of the Spirit. So did you know that God's eternal life gives you the power to be, to have love and to have joy and to have peace and patience rule your heart? And it gives you the ability to be kind even when people aren't kind to you. And you can be good and you can be faithful and you can be gentle and you can live a self-controlled life. Not in your flesh but in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Tremendous, exceeding, abundant power in Christ. And how is all this possible? Because it's generated by God Himself. Eternal life lives within us in the residing person of God's Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes I, I just want to shout to the church, uh, Christ's church, wake up. Stop living unconfidently. Stop compromising as if the world's power is greater than God's power. We have God's truth. We have God's gospel. We have God's spirit. Therefore, we've got God's power. Church, let's start living like it. Amen? So, are you convinced that you should be confident as you have eternal life? Mm-hmm. Well, next time we're going to continue with this one. God's children are to be confident that God answers their prayers. You don't want to miss that one. Let's pray. Lord, I, I just, I thank you again for your word. And I thank you, God, please um, take your investment of this time. It's not just something we hear here today. But Lord, that it would be something we hear all week long and all month long, and that we we take this, you'd, you'd put these truths deep within us, Lord, so that we can live differently. We don't just want to be hearers of your word, God. We want to be doers of your word. And I, Lord, I know I needed to hear this message more than anybody here. So Lord, please help you. not only Commission Church, our little church body, this little flock, but God, I pray for your church around this world that we would have a better understanding like Paul prayed for us in, in Ephesians chapter 3. He says, I want you to understand the love of God all the more so that you have that strength that comes in the inner man so that you understand what the power of God is all for His glory. And Lord, I pray that prayer for us. Your church today is it's withering and it's, and it's cowering not everybody is, but so much of it. Lord, put an end to that. Purify your church, strengthen your church, and use your church mightily for your name and your glory.
time is short, Lord. Now is the time to fight the good fight. In Jesus' name, amen.